In the final video for this module, we're going to talk about questionnaire format and questionnaire design. And so we'll focus on things like what respondents are actually thinking about when they're responding to questions and how to structure surveys in particular. Questionnaire format comes in four different categories. We have personal interviews, phone interviews, mail questionnaires, and internet surveys. And those four modalities differ considerably across two main dimensions. One is cost. And then the other is the degree to which respondents are paying attention to what it is that you're actually talking about. So for instance, personal interviews are very expensive. You have to hire a person to actually administer those interviews one-on-one. -on -one. You have to compensate individuals a lot more when they're dealing with personal interviews than say male interviews. However, they're really going to be paying attention. When somebody's standing right in front of you, reading a set of questions from a survey, it's very hard to just ignore them and check your email while that's happening. So there's a trade-off. On the other extreme, when you have internet-based surveys, now they're very inexpensive because the administration is, is almost free. You do have to compensate a little bit for participation, but certainly there's not a moderator sitting there and actually asking people questions. On the other hand, it's very tempting to watch a YouTube video or check your email or check your social media while you're responding to a questionnaire. So the quality of those data differ. Now, the question of which format is most appropriate is dependent on what your research program is. If you need incredibly high quality data and you have a large budget, in-person interviews or maybe phone interviews might be very appropriate for what you're doing. If you have a small budget or if the research question you're asking isn't all that central to the decision-making process, mail interviews or internet interviews are just fine. The decision about what to do is based on how much budget you have and based on how important it is that the respondents are incredibly thoughtful about the answers that they're providing to the questions you give them. So I don't have an answer for which approach is best. It's really going to depend on you and your specific business needs and the research question that you're asking. Now, thinking about the questionnaire design, I'm once again going to remind you that when people answer your survey, they are busy, they are distracted, they are bored, they are unmotivated, and they are tired, and they don't care about your stupid survey. In other words, they're not interested in serving your purpose of collecting data. They're interested in getting done and maybe getting compensated. That's about it. With that, we can start thinking about the types of problems that might creep in with specific formatting for questions and structure to surveys. But the basic tenet overall that we're going to be dealing with is if you ask a question, you'll get a response. And this is very much analogous to the idea of garbage in, garbage out. Just because you have people giving you data doesn't mean that those data are worth much at all. So we'll focus on five specific ways in which we should be considering questionnaire and survey design. Now, of course, there are others that we should be thinking about, but these are really the ones that are the big ones and that are most important. And they are necessity, participant knowledge, question wording, frame of reference, and order effects. Necessity is perhaps one of the most important things that is often neglected. And it is that for every single question that you ask in a survey, you have to ask yourself, is it necessary that this question is asked? Very often you find that survey design is done in a form where people just throw questions at a survey because they kind of want to know. But it doesn't inform their decision-making process. And all it does is it annoys respondents because it's just this long winding survey that lasts way too long. In fact, a general rule of thumb that I like to follow is that your survey, you get five minutes of people's attention. That's it. If we're talking about pencil and paper, that's about two pages of questions. Any more than that, and you're just gonna get people tuning out and not paying attention. So think about necessity. Do you need to ask this question? Is it important to the decision-making process? And think way back to the first part of class where we talked about backward market research. If the point of research is to assist you in making a specific decision, that will guide you in deciding whether a question is necessary or whether it's superfluous and just something you're throwing in because you're curious. There's almost no version of just asking, I'm curious questions. Instead, focus on questions that will lend themselves to decision making. Another thing to consider is the knowledge that your participants have. For instance, you might ask a question that seems very innocuous at first, like this. Please rate the following fast food restaurants on food quality from one to seven, and here are the four options. But you're assuming that participants have actually gone to those restaurants, that have actually eaten there. That's a strong assumption. As soon as you have a situation where your participants lack the knowledge to answer a question, you're gonna get garbage data. They're gonna to respond to you, but the response will be meaningless. But you, as a researcher, will never know that it's a meaningless response. Instead, you'll just assume that it's truth. And that's a huge problem. And there's, of course, ways to deal with things like this. For instance, using filter questions. Ask people, have you ever been to Burger King? And if they have, then follow up by asking them how much they enjoyed it. And if they haven't, they don't answer that next question. Any of these questions that would allow an honest response, that would indicate lack of knowledge or lack of frequency of going, 
will allow you to filter out people from asking subsequent questions that would require a set of knowledge gleaned from actually, let's say, going to one of those restaurants. There's also a myriad of problems with the way the questions are worded. So what I'll do here is I'll give you an example, and I'll ask you to think for just a second about what's wrong with that particular wording. So our first one is, why do you like Wendy's fresh meat hamburgers better than those of competitors? What's wrong with that question? This is a pretty classic example of what's known as a leading question. You're telling people the answer that you'd like to get before you actually ask the question. When you say, why do you think that it's better, the implication is that it's better. What you want to do instead is remove that and say, do you believe that Wendy's hamburgers are better than competitors? Or differently, just ask how much people like hamburgers from different venues, assuming they have the knowledge to answer those questions. When you do the version that's on the screen, however, you are susceptible to getting responses that are not true reflections of what people believe. Now, as always, I like to add a little bit of humor, so here's a short video clip from one of my all-time favorite sitcoms that makes this point really nicely. Okay, look, I didn't want it to have to come to this, but Anne, please open the sealed envelope that's in your binder. This is a little something I learned from Carl Rove. If you want to guarantee the results of a survey, you design the question to give you the answer that you want. Wouldn't you rather have a park than a storage facility for nuclear waste? That seems iffy. Yeah, don't worry about it. I made it all up. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Wouldn't you agree, like most decent Americans, that it would be a good idea to turn the abandoned lot on Sullivan Street into a beautiful community park? Oh, actually, no. I'm not really a fan of parks. Very noisy, barbecue smell all the time. Would you change your mind if I told you that nine out of ten meth users said the same exact thing? What? How would you even know that? Survey. We surveyed crystal meth users. Okay, I know that was really silly, but it makes a point. When you lead people in how they're going to answer a question, you're going to get garbage results. So let's go to our next problem of question wording. Do you eat at fast food restaurants regularly? Yes or no? What's wrong with that one? Well, that's an ambiguous question. What does it mean to eat regularly? For you, that might be eat there once a week. For me, it might be eat there once a month. And for someone else, it might be eat there once a day. If you want to ask a question, be hyper-specific. Do you eat at Wendy's every day, every week, every month, and so on? Make sure that everyone reading your question interprets it exactly the same way. If there's any deviation in interpretation, you're no longer asking one question to a bunch of people, but you're asking lots of different questions to different people, and you have no idea which people are answering which question. So again, be hyper-specific. Okay, how about this one? What is the occasion for eating your first hamburger? What's wrong with this question? Well, this is an unanswerable question. Who the hell remembers the first time they eat a hamburger? No one does. If anything, they're going to give you a guess, and a guess is not useful. Beyond the unanswerable piece, who cares? Why does it matter when somebody ate their first hamburger? That's not relevant. It's also possible that they never had a hamburger. So how do they answer it? And again, if you ask people this question, they'll give you an answer, but it's going to be garbage. So make sure that the question has a specific answer that is reasonably accessible to people and can be provided to you in a short time frame. How about this one? Do you eat Wendy's hamburger and chili? Yes or no? What's wrong with this question? Well, this is what's known as a double-barreled question, or asking two questions at once. What if you eat hamburgers but not chili? Or chili and not hamburgers? How do you respond? Well, you can't, because this is asking two questions at the same time. Better would be to split this out into two separate questions, one about hamburgers and one about chili. Okay, what about this one? Where do you live? At home or in a dormitory? Well, this is a non-exhaustive set of options. What if you don't live at home or in a dormitory, but you live in an apartment? And also, this is pretty ambiguous. What do you mean, home? Do you mean the home that you grew up in? Well, what if you grew up in multiple places? Or do you mean that the apartment that you live in right now is home? This is both ambiguous and also non-exhaustive in terms of the options that one could respond to. An easy fix to any of these types of questions, by the way, is to add an other category. Because that way, instead of someone randomly checking whatever they want to check, they will answer other and fill that in for you, thus providing more accurate and reasonable data. Finally, what about this one? What is your age? Under 20? 20 to 40, 40 and over. What's wrong with this one? Well, this is what's known as having a non-mutually exclusive set of answers. In other words, what do I do if I'm 40 years old? Do I check the middle option or do I check the right option? I'll pick one of them, but the interpretation for you will be wildly different depending on which I choose. So this is an easy fix. Just make sure there's no overlap. Under 20, 20 to 40, 41 and over. Easy enough to fix. And in case you think this stuff is silly, I have a tendency to answer every survey that's ever sent to me because I teach this course. 
And on occasion, I'll take a screenshot of some of the really crazy ones. So here's one that I got from Best Buy. This was an actual survey, and I know it's hard to see, so I'll zoom in on one specific question. The question is, I love using technology and entertainment products, but I hate shopping for them. Agreed or disagree? This is insane. First of all, what if I like using technology products and hate shopping for them, but like entertainment products, but hate shopping for those? And what if I use technology and entertainment products, but I don't hate shopping for them? Or what if I love using entertainment products, I hate shopping for those, but I love shopping for technology products, but I don't actually like using those? The point is, that this is an incredibly hard question to ask, but this is what's being asked. These are actual, this is an actual survey that was sent out. This is a disaster. And what will happen is you will get responses to the survey. People will interpret those responses to mean something, but they'll be acting on data that comes from respondents who have no idea what the hell they're saying. And so those data are practically useless. Okay, moving aside from question wording, we want to generally avoid complex questions. So for example, here's a question. Of the total number of miles you drove during the past year, approximately what percentage was for driving to and from work? How would anyone even begin to answer that kind of a question? I mean, there's an answer to it, but it's really, really hard to calculate. And if it's really hard to calculate, you'll get a response, but it'll be messy. So don't ask questions where the answer is so complex that it's unreasonable for respondents to actually answer it. Another one is to always be very specific. So for example, here's a question. How many members are there in your family? What family? My nuclear family? My immediate family? My larger family? Different cultures have different definitions for what constitutes family. Are we talking about people that have married into my family or just people that, that share the same bloodline? Like, what are we talking about here? Be hyper specific. How many biological siblings do you have? How many adoptive siblings do you have? How many parents do you have? How many cousins do you have? How many grandparents do you have? You get the idea. If this is an important question for you as a researcher, be specific enough that the response will actually be useful. When you are vague, you will get an answer, and it may not be the answer that you're interested in because people's interpretation of the question may be different than your intention when writing that question. Aside from specific question wording, we want to think about some of the unintended consequences that are around specific types of questions. So here's a very classic example of a question that was asked and some consequences that came from it. How many hours of television do you watch in an average weekday? Please pick the bucket that best reflects your answer. And in this particular case, there were two different versions of this questionnaire created. One is what's called the low frequency set. And you can see that the buckets were up to half an hour, half an hour to one hour, one hour to one and a half hours, and so on. And another group was called the high frequency scale. This one had things like up to two and a half hours, two and a half hours to three hours, and so on. Now, the amount of time you actually spend watching television does not depend on the scale that you're given. There's just an answer. It's just true, whatever it happens to be. But it turns out there's a big difference when you ask it on these two different options. And the thing I want to highlight is if you had a specific question, which was how many people watch more than two and a half hours of television? Well, if you use the left one, the low frequency scale, only the people who selected that fifth option would constitute someone who watched more than two and a half hours of television. But if you looked at the right set, the high frequency options, anyone who answered options two, three, four, five, or six would fall into your category. Now again, it shouldn't matter which scale you use. What matters is how much television you watch. But it turns out it matters a lot. In fact, when this was done, only 16% of respondents indicated they watched more than two and a half hours of television using the low frequency scale, but 37% indicated with the high frequency scale. Now, I don't think that the people who answered the high frequency scale actually watched more television. What actually happened is this tendency to avoid extreme responses. And the low frequency option, nobody wants to seem like someone who watches so much television. And so they infer from the scale options that the highest response value here, more than two and a half hours, must be a lot. And because of that, they're reluctant to admit that, even though truly they might watch that much television. When we look at the high frequency option, that's just not true. People will gladly respond towards the middle of the scale here. And so you get many more people. If you look at the high frequency option, that situation doesn't play out. To indicate that you watch more than two and a half hours of television, any one of a series of options will be acceptable. And the scale seems to signal that more than four and a half hours is where you get into too much television watching. So more people are willing to admit that they watch that much television. So when you're constructing these types of scales, just be very careful about how you choose the anchors because there are consequences to choosing incorrectly. Another example is what we call aided versus unaided scales. So imagine I ask the question, what do you consider to be the most important thing for children to prepare them for life? And I just give you a bunch of spaces and you write in whatever you write in. And another case, what I might do is first provide a few options, like check these, and then also write in whatever you want. People could indicate anything they want in both of these cases, but because I gave people options, it might bring to mind things that they wouldn't otherwise consider. So for example, if we hone in on this question to think for themselves, what you find is that in the aided version, the one on the right, 62% of people are willing to say that that's an important thing 
to raising good children. But when you don't prompt them with that idea in the unaided version, the one on the left, only 5% of people say that. But if you as a researcher want to know what people really care about for this particular question, by providing that option, you're bringing it to mind something that probably wouldn't have been brought to mind spontaneously. Now, that's not to say that this isn't an important dimension for raising good children. It's just not one that people tend to think about unless you tell them to think about it. So when you provide aided response options, like the ones on the right here, be very mindful about what consequences that might have. In summary, though, what you really want to be doing is making sure that you respect your respondents. That means no typos. That means no confusing questions. That means being specific. That means organizing your questions in such a manner that makes logical sense. If people are jumping around different topics all over the place in your survey, they're just going to tune out. The less professional your survey seems, the less straightforward it is, the less clear it is, the more people are either going to quit or start circling at random, both of which are problems for you. So when you're designing surveys, be incredibly mindful about who's going to be completing them. You as the creator care deeply about every word on that page, but your respondent really, really doesn't care. And if you can take that mindset of someone who just doesn't care, you will be designing much better and much higher quality surveys. Now in class, we'll debrief the Harvard Housing Survey case, as well as give you a chance to develop some of these skills in survey design and survey critique more explicitly. After that, we're going to pivot completely to thinking about data analysis and how we take some of the things we learn from these surveys, conduct statistical analyses that inform specific marketing decisions.